be seated. For commercial galleries and glass shops, uh, an apprentice would be uh, probably five to ten years. The relationships between uh, the master and the apprentice is um, quite dynamic and the demands on, on both uh, sides of the fence. And there's a lot of coordination between two different people uh, with two different skill sets uh, working at the same time. And there is an etiquette with uh, glass blowing shops where there is no fault uh, with the helper if something goes wrong, because that means the, uh, the master wasn't clear enough in the instructions uh, to make it happen. So uh, they, the thing about those masters is that make it look so easy, um, but it is not. To become a master, uh, at least uh, 10 years. Uh, and I don't really consider myself a master at all, uh, but I've been blowing glass for 25 years and it's uh, it's always a challenge it's uh, every time you work on something it's uh, brand new apprenticeship the relationship that Jesus invites us into you and me the master inviting his disciple student learner pupil apprentice into a direct and dynamic relationship. So that over time in this apprentice relationship, you and I as apprentices begin to learn how to live and love like Jesus lived and loved. What an amazing thing it would be to learn to live that way. Jesus never worried about anything, was never in a hurry. Imagine that. Jesus was never running late anywhere. This week, I had the distinct privilege of going out to Howard Payne University and uh, speaking in student chapel this week. I, I'm a graduate at Howard Payne, and it's where Valerie and I met and uh, fell in love. And uh, I got to go back to speak at chapel this week, uh, Wednesday, and we allowed two hours for the drive because Siri said it took two hours, two hours and a minute to get to Howard Payne University. I was to speak at 10 o'clock, so we left at 9.30. Left two hours and a little bit of extra time because I always like to get where I'm going to speak uh, in about 30 minutes in advance so that I have time to do a mic check and make sure everything's uh, in order and go to the restroom and make sure my host is not worried about me thinking that I've forgotten or gotten lost or uh, am not coming or whatever. And uh, so we allowed two hours to get there, not realizing that uh, somewhere between Evan and Goldthwaite, and then a second time between Mullen and Zephyr, they would be having road construction and taking the two-lane highway down to just one lane, where we stopped and had to talk to Bubba for a while holding the stop sign while we were waiting for the other traffic to come. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to be talking about apprenticeship and living and loving like Jesus, and Jesus is giving me an opportunity to practice. <laughs> Please do not ask Valerie how I did. I think I did better than usual. Imagine living and loving like Jesus. That's what you and I are designed to do. We've been talking about this apprenticeship relationship where we believe in Jesus and seek to be with Jesus and be a learner of Jesus and today to become like Jesus and next week to behave like Jesus. Here's the main idea for the whole series. The more you and I trust, believe in, have confidence in Jesus, seek to be with Jesus, learn from Jesus, the more we will become like Jesus. Now, it's not trying harder. It's not giving forth more sweat equity. It's not even simple behavior modification. It's not looking at a wristband and saying, what would Jesus do? Or contemplating what he might do and then trying to mimic it. It is something hugely more than that. It is nothing short of supernatural transformation, spiritual metamorphosis. We become like Jesus because the master 
transforms his apprentice from the inside out. And he does it by his grace. So this morning, we are called and designed, and God is working on us so that we might become more like Jesus. Take a copy of God's Word and look with me on the church app in John 14. The Gospel of John chapter 14. I I want us to get to that place where it's been the getting place for us in this series. All this series has been in John 14. And we're going to see again today how this text speaks to us. Jesus is speaking with his disciples at the Last Supper, the night before he's to be crucified. And they are down to 11 people because Judas, the betrayer, has already bailed and left. And so the 11 disciples that are left are hearing things coming out of Jesus' mouth they do not like. They've been traveling with him, believing in him, following him for three years, 24-7, 365 for three years. They're excited that they're going to be in the ground floor of this new kingdom on earth he's going to begin. And all of a sudden, he starts talking like a crazy man. He talks about leaving them behind and things like dying and sacrificing and all of this. And it is really messing with their minds. And Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 1 says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Guys, don't let this throw you. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The very first sermon in this series, we talked about how Christ calls us to believe, trust in, have confidence in him. Then he says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. He's encouraging these disciples, these apprentices, that being with them and them being with him is a big, big deal to Jesus. Here's what I want you to know. I do not know if you being with Jesus is a big deal, but you being with Jesus is a big deal to Jesus. In fact, he guarantees that he will be with us. Even though he was going to be absent physically, bodily from them, he promised the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, The helper, the spirit of Christ would come in his place. Look in verse 16 of John 14. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus reminds us in this passage that we are to believe in Jesus and be with Jesus and learn from Jesus so that we can become like Jesus. Now, I want to point out to you that the purpose of this apprenticeship we've been talking about may be a little different than what you realize. The whole purpose that Jesus invites us into this relationship for is this transformation of our being made like Jesus. In the beginning, we were created, we were made in the likeness, in the image of God. But then sin came into our lives and messed everything up. And from then on, God's plan has been to work his plan and work his work so that we could be restored and brought back to being made in the likeness and image of God. So that we are transformed from the inside out as believers, as we are with Jesus and learn from Jesus, so that we are made into the likeness of Christ, being transformed into the likeness of our master. Now, some people think that the purpose of this apprenticeship is the end product or the byproduct, the living like and loving like Jesus. They think that is the goal. As if it's that we're, you know, if Jesus were an artist or a craftsman or a trade uh, trainer, what he was trying to do is just duplicate his artwork or his handicraft. That, that's not it at all. Paul even says we are the handiwork of Christ. 
We need to understand that his purpose and his goal is not the byproduct of our living and loving like him. That will come, but that is almost sort of anticlimactic because the real purpose of the apprenticeship is to make us more like Christ. Our development, our transformation, our being restored back into his likeness. When uh, my son, Worth, got to be of a certain age, he was tired of watching me mow and trim. He wanted to participate. I had gotten, him when he was very much a toddler, a little mower that would go alongside and make a little whirring sound, and then bubbles would come out the top. He, he was through with that. He wanted to help me mow with my mower and trim with my trimmer. So when he was about eight or nine, we took, by the way, just save your emails, we took all the safety precautions. I mean, listen, okay, I had to answer to his mother. I shouldn't also have to answer to you, okay? And it was satisfying her. So anyway, just save your emails. We took all the safety precautions, and he began to push the mower with me and do the trimmer with me. And I have to tell you something, it took me four times as long to get it done. And I was, Brother Gary, I was frustrated. It slowed me down. I really kind of was wanting to get this done and then get on with my, my Friday, you know, my day off. So I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to be able to get this done, but, but Worth wanted to, wanted to mow with me. Now, in the long run, you know, they didn't last all that long, right? You know, once they hit, you know, it lasted about three or four mowings and trimmings, and then he was like, he was done with that. I had to pay him after that to get him to do it, right? But anyway, for a time there, and I was kind of frustrated with this whole thing of it slowing me down, and the, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder. I'll never forget it, and the Lord spoke to me over the roar of the lawnmower and said, Joe, your project is not your yard. Your project is your son and your relationship with him. So I began to, whatever we were doing together, mowing, trimming, playing baseball, whatever we did, I began to see it as an avenue for me to pour into my son. I developed things I could do with my daughters as well to pour into their lives. Will you look this way? I want you to hear this. The master pours his life into his apprentices. That's what he does. Look in verse 18 through 23 in John chapter 14. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. The master pours himself into the life of the apprentice. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Now, Judas, not Iscariot, wait, you remember that two of the 12 were named Judas, right? And Judas the Iscariot was the betrayer, so there was Judas Iscariot, and there was Judas, not Iscariot, okay, all right, so... Imagine that is your last name. <laughs> so Judas, the other one, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, sort of. <laughs> he didn't answer that question, but he answered what he wanted to say. Answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Wow. Jesus and the father together pour themselves into the life of the apprentice, the disciple, the believer, the one who's truly chasing after relationship with. The more we seek to be with Jesus and learn from Jesus, the more we learn to live and love his way, and the more he pours himself into our lives. This is the key to our being able to become like Jesus. 
Jesus pours himself into us. We also see that this is exactly the dynamic of relationship between the Father and the Son. Look in verses 10 and 11. Jesus says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. The Father pours himself into the Son, and the Son and the Father pour themselves into the apprentice. And it has this incredible dynamic effect of us becoming like Jesus. Now, Dallas Willard is a guy that Evan and I have quoted a lot in this series because we each read his book this year, Divine Conspiracy, which is a fantastic book. It's, it's a huge book. It's, it's a challenging book. I, I read it the first time about 20 years ago. I read it again this year, and each time I've read it, it takes me about three months to read it because it is, it is heady stuff. But he is such the expert on this idea of apprenticeship. We've also talked a lot about a young pastor out in Portland, Oregon, in his 30s named John Mark Comer, who is just this savantly brilliant believer and speaker of God's truth. And uh, these guys uh, have written some great stuff on this topic. Dallas Willard talks about this idea of Jesus pouring himself into us as we seek to get closer to him and do what he says do, and he more and more discloses us, like the text says, himself to us. I mean, look at that. He says uh, uh, in verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and disclose myself to him. It's the idea of the closer we get and the more we participate in this apprentice relationship, the more Jesus is going to pour himself in and the more he is going to do that, the more we are going to become like him. What Dallas Willard says is that it's this abundance of obedience, flywheel effect. Now, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I, I want to show you a little video about flywheels and how they work. They are a tool to enhance uh, speed and power. So let's look at the video, and you'll have to read the narration for yourself. There is no audio. It's a flywheel. weighs about 5,000 pounds, so you can read from there, okay? Key point here, the momentum of the thing kicks in your favor at breakthrough. And it's an unstoppable momentum. An overall accumulation of effort. As we believe in Jesus and seek to be with Jesus and learn from Jesus and obey what Jesus said for us to do, to practice the things he taught us to practice, we get closer. He pours more and more in. And Dallas Willard describes it as an abundance, obedience, flywheel effect. This is what he means. You and I, the more we we seek to be with Jesus and learn from Jesus and read the scriptures and learn what he said and observe what he did, the more we are overwhelmed with the abundance of love that Jesus pours out toward us and we become the kind of people that want to do what Jesus said do. And as we attempt to do that, he doesn't expect perfection. It's not about the result. It's just about our attempt, about our desire. The more we seek to do those things he said do, the more he discloses himself and the more he pours himself into. And then we receive even more abundance and we want to obey even more. And so he gives us even more and there's more abundance. And it's abundance and obedience and abundance and obedience and abundance and obedience that kicks in as a flywheel eventually. And we become more and more and more like Christ. Don't get this wrong. It's not about earning it. Grace is still all that matters. You and I could never, ever try to convince God to pour himself into us. It's not by what we've earned. But effort is something that we do. It's something that we participate in, our part, to allow God to work inside of us. Now, Paul talks about it in a little bit different way. If you look over in Romans chapter 8, here's how Paul says it. 
Paul says in chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Conformed. Made to be in the same form. To morph something into something it is not by itself. That's the idea. Then over in chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, Paul says it this way. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says we have control over the first part of that. Don't any longer be conformed. Don't be morphed to the ways of the world. That's in our control. You and I have the ability to say no to being formed or morphed into the ways of the world. We do not have to go along with the stream. We don't have to do that. We can say no to it. And Paul is saying don't do that. Instead, be transformed. But get this. We don't have any control over that except to give in to it. It's not, he doesn't say get transformed. He doesn't say transform yourself. He says be transformed for you Uh, grammar people, it's in the passive, and so it is something that happens to us, that we allow to happen to us by God working in our life. We can be transformed. It is the work of God in us by his grace. Now, next week, as we wrap up the series, we're going to actually talk about that byproduct of living like and loving like. We're going we're gonna to read a, a mind-blowing verse in John chapter 14. You go back there, I'll show it to you. You can read it in advance. We've skipped over it because we wanted to save it till the very last Sunday. But John chapter 14 verse 12 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And even greater works than these, he will do. That's mind-blowing. That's our potential. That becomes our capacity, even becomes our second nature. And we'll even kind of slip over into chapter 15 and talk about the fruit that comes from our being the branches in right relationship with the vine. A little different metaphor there. Not apprentices, but as part of the vine. But that's for next week. I want you to see that that's just the byproduct. Because here's the truth. As you and I believe in Jesus and seek to be with Jesus and learn from Jesus, and attempt to practice living like he taught us to live, the more he transforms us and makes us in his likeness, and we become like Jesus, and then the behaving like Jesus is just the default that happens because we've become like Jesus. It's an automatic deal. And so this morning, I want to ask you to think about some things. The first thing I want to ask you to think about is this. Whether this is your first Sunday hearing this series on apprenticeship or you've been here or watched online for all four of the sermons so far in this series, I want to ask you this question. If you do a self-assessment, if you conduct a self-assessment, where are you as an apprentice? Where are you on the path? It's not necessarily linear A, B, C, D, but it is fairly much that way. Where are you? Maybe today your action step is that you need to believe. You need to actually start your apprentice relationship with Jesus as your master. You need to place your belief, your faith, have trust in, have confidence in Jesus as your Savior and start this apprentice relationship. My encouragement to you is this, believe in Jesus. Maybe you're already a believer, but you're struggling with believing. You have some very, very serious doubts. You've even thought about kind of chunking it and going some other direction. Maybe you're a lot like these guys were around the table thinking, you know, I'm not sure Jesus wasn't a crazy man. I've been following him for a while, but I just don't know if I can keep doing that. My encouragement to you is re-up, keep on, keep at believing. It doesn't mean try harder. It just means don't quit. Don't quit. 
Maybe your action step today is different. You're, you're there. You, you, you are believing. You, you are keeping on believing, even though sometimes it's hard. We encourage you to ruthlessly carve out time and space to be with Jesus. And I want you to hear this. This isn't your little daily quiet time. This isn't for you to just, uh, you know, fire up your favorite devotional to read or open up that favorite little devotional that just kind of gets your little day going. I'm talking about spending time with you. I'm not even talking about listening to sermons or podcasts, even great ones like mine. I'm talking about spending time directly with Jesus. That was a joke. Come on, lighten up, all right? Okay, y'all know that. I mean, my wife's here. She heard me say that, so you don't have to worry about me, okay? All right? She'll straighten all that out when we get to the house, okay? All right? But spending time directly with Jesus. We've encouraged you last week to begin to think about spending time in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts, to really hone in on the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus. In those five books, there are 117 chapters, and if you were to take those 117 chapters and read one per day, you could do that in a year's time three times with some left over. Better yet, what you could do is from now to the end of 2020, just focus on the Gospel of John. Go back to John 1 and begin to read through the Gospel of John and think about all that Jesus said and mark down all the things Jesus did. Write it down. And then January, the first quarter of 2021, go to Matthew. Second quarter, go to Mark. Third quarter, go to Luke. Fourth quarter, go to the book of Acts. And then 2022, start over. And just really hone in on what Jesus said and what Jesus did. But today, maybe your step is really engaging this flywheel plan. And that is thinking seriously about some things that Jesus, you know, is teaching you, you need to practice. You need to obey. Again, he's not expecting perfection. He wants desire to follow. Attempt. Your part, effort. Engagement in the relationship. By doing something the way the master taught you to do it. That's what obedience is. And so I want to encourage you to start with the easy stuff and build up to the tough stuff and let Jesus begin to transform you in your life. In fact, if you think about it, you might even, how do you make a list? I make a list about making all the, and I usually start with the thing that's the easiest, but before that, I add to the list something I've already completed so I can mark a line through it. Anybody else do that around here? Okay. Okay. Am I the only one? All right. So maybe you would take that thing you do fairly well already and then you would take it to God and see if you could become a master of it. And then let him add this and then let him add that and then let him add this and let him add that. And before long, you receive abundance and obedience and abundance and obedience. Engage the flywheel effect because Christ wants you to be like him. So... Whatever you need to do in this apprentice relationship, it's up to you to take that next step. Would you do that?